So this is a pipeline embolization device for an unruptured internal carotid artery aneurysm. Next slide, please. So this is a 62-year-old gentleman, former smoker, presented with dizziness after a car accident. Neurologically attacked on exam, but he underwent an MRI given the dizziness, which showed an incidental unruptured left internal carotid artery aneurysm. We did a diagnostic angiogram a couple of weeks ago, which confirmed a paraophthalmic uh, segment uh, location of this aneurysm, measuring about 10 millimeters. Next slide, please. Here we have the MRI demonstrating uh, the aneurysm on the left ICA. Next slide. And then here's the diagnostic angiogram. Next slide. So the treatment options in this case are either open surgical, which includes craniotomy and clipping of the aneurysm, or even a bypass procedure, um, or the endovascular methods include primary coil embolization, stent-assisted coiling, or flow diversion, which, uh, which we'll, we'll be pursuing today with a pipeline, pipeline end of embolization device. Um, next slide. The pipeline device is specifically designed to uh, promote thrombosis within the aneurysm dome while allowing side branches to remain patent. So we chose this uh, because if you go back one slide, I'm sorry, two slides, you'll see that the ophthalmic artery comes out directly near the origin of the aneurysm or the neck of the aneurysm. So it's important to leave that patent uh, during the uh, during the case and, and afterwards. My name is Jay Mako. I'm uh, the attending neurosurgeon for the PACE. This is my partner and co-attending, Dr. Reed DeLacy, uh, fellows, Dr. Sharam and Dr. Kurt. Um, if you're able to see the uh, picture, can you guys show the fluoro? You'll see a roadmap. We came transradially. We then uh, formed a Simmons II in the right common did a run of the head to make sure no clots went up and everything was fine. And then we used it to select the left carotid, which you can see the negative roadmap there. We put an 038 glide wire up into the internal and brought the Neuron Max, which is an 088 guide, into the proximal left internal carotid artery. So that's our access. If you take a shot of the wrist, if that's possible, what you're gonna see is the Neuron Max is in as its own sheath. So it is it is a sheath type device. Uh, we do not have another sheath around it. So this way we have eight French uh, access, but with the equivalent of having a six French sheath. In you guys are basically using it, so in a, in, a, in a sense, you're using it as a sheathless guide catheter. That is correct. So just getting some working projections now for the aneurysm, basically we want to see the distal landing zone of the stent, so the area of the artery beyond where the aneurysm is, where you're going to place it, and the proximal landing zone, and a decent idea about the aneurysm neck. For these kind of aneurysms that are slightly larger, that are wide neck, occasionally we'll put some coils in the aneurysm to try and promote early thrombosis of the aneurysm, so that's what we're going to do today. So the setup that Jay's got is the Neuron Max, which is more or less hubbed at the wrist, and it's up at the origin of the internal carotid artery in the neck with a, an 050 intermediate catheter, which you can just see just at the bottom of the screen, just below the petrous segment of the ICA, and a microcatheter. Right now, he's, he's accessing the aneurysm with the microcatheter, and we're going to put a couple of coils. With the coils that we use, obviously, it's similar to peripheral. There's different complex shapes that, that we have available to us. They're all detachable coils. And the well, first one is, is usually catheter. slightly stiffer. It's, one, one it's a complex shape that might form a ball or a square or a cube to try and press against the aneurysm wall just marginally to create a bit of a basket for the, for the remaining filling coils to, to be able to sit and nest properly. MC, MTI. And in this case, we've chosen a microsphere coil, which uh, has a particular trait of not finding extra space, but really taking a very fixed boxy shape which is what we want here. Yeah, we don't medallion. want it to come down and find its way into the parent artery. We just want to create a little one bit of thrombogenicity in the dome. Great, thanks. For aneurysms that are about one centimeter or larger, there have been reports of delayed aneurysmal rupture after putting in a flow diverter. So no one completely understands the hemodynamics there, but the feeling is that by having at least one decent amount of coil mass in the aneurysm, It'll make it predisposed to thrombose more quickly. So you'll see this aneurysm takes a very boxy shape. See, even it wants to go down by the neck. There we go. Now it's set. 
Uh, I'm putting in just this one because it's 17 centimeters in length, and I feel like that's going to give me an adequate amount of coverage without getting me in trouble. I really don't want it to be that close to the neck if I can help it, so I'm repositioning a little bit here. So for, I mean, for diagnostic cerebral angiography, it's it's the same heparin load that we give to everybody with the access, so 3,000 units of heparin. Mm -hmm. for, for brain intervention cases, it, it depends. I mean, there's different schools of thought. You can either measure ACT and go by twice baseline we get, we get and target baseline. that, which is usually somewhere between five and 6,000 as a bolus huh? in total. Or, or some people on spec will just give 5,000, especially for aneurysm cases, brain AVMs and dural fistulas and head and neck cases are slightly different by the risk profile of thrombotic events versus hemorrhagic yeah. events. But in general, 4 .5 usually 5 to 6,000 will get you somewhere near twice baseline ACT. Phenom, please. So you can see we just navigated past the coil mass. This is obviously the most concerning part here because I, what I don't want to do is dislodge the coils. Uh, which is partly why, uh, as someone else pointed out before, I tend to prefer to um, to jail, but it is what it is at this point. What kind of wire are you using here? Mass. This is a Synchro. Okay. Synchro 14 or 10? Synchro, or 2, st synchro 2 standard. Okay. No, okay. Uh, 14. It's a 14,000 uh, standard stiffness wire. Okay. Yeah. So we cross the lesion, go into... Really, I like to just get into the origins of the M2, like so. Take this, please. Uh, Microcatheter for injection. Actually, I can just do it with the larger one. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, at this That's stage, perfect. triaxial systems for delivering these these kind of stents is, is standard. Uh, more or less because, you know, with braided stents, especially ones that get to larger diameters and larger lengths, they can be a bit stiff and harder to push with more friction. So decreasing that amount of step between the catheter and the side of the vessel wall can help taking some loops out of the out of the push. So that's why the DDC is up as high as it is. If you guys can see that's in the uh, right at the ascending to to a uh, horizontal petra segment transition point. So so how, so yeah. how much long, how much room do you Go think ahead. you need to do these cases uh you know from in the I would say close to 100% of the cases from the radial approach. I mean what what are we talking about in length of Guides and think, diagnostic yeah, catheters. Yeah, what are we 10 missing? centimeters. Yeah, I think you need okay. remembering that this this guy's anatomy is almost straight as an arrow, and this is this is hubbed. He's a regular size kind of guy, like taller patients, long but bigger problems. Cool. Patients with tortuosity and ectasia, bigger problems. So 10 centimeters is a good is a good rule of thumb, I think. But hand in hand with that, you know, if if you lengthen these these guiding and intermediate catheters you need to improve and lengthen the selecting catheters so we're not doing exchanges like you know, three meter wire exchange wires, 260 centimeter exchange wires into the carotid because it kind of ends up you know, creating a problem for yourself that didn't otherwise exist if you went femorally. I took a little bit of energy off so that the catheter wasn't quite so twisted so that there's less likely of twisting of the of the pipeline itself. Now the patient may move a little here because this is a little discomforting. So you guys are using oh, um, biplane, correct? We're 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 only seeing one yes. view. Uh, just just for, for technical reasons, we only have we only have one view. But you're looking at this in both views. That yeah. is correct. Correct. So microcatheter is just unsheathing the stand. It's a little bit hard to see on the AP, but it's you know the the stand is is constrained by the microcatheter and uh, some PTFE flaps at the distal end. So as you start unsheathing it, just like all braided stents, it starts to shorten and, and, uh, and expand, and that's what it's done right now. So it's nicely seated distally. Jay's just coming down to the proximal cavernous and now the vertical petrus. He's just applying some load to get the stent to open a bit, and now he's unsheathing it. But now the delivery wire will come out. You can see it's a little bit offset as it comes into the microcatheter. That's from the PTFE flaps at the distal margin. So there's a little micro run through the catheter just to make sure that distally there's no dissection. It's still open. It's free flowing. There's no spasm. Jay's just bringing the intermediate catheter up into the stent. Again, you can push the stent up against the wall a little bit better. He's maintaining access within the stent. Again, if we need to go 
out out through the vessel uh, lumen to do some angioplasty. The micro guide wires won't go through the interstices of this stent. There's 44. There's a 44 braid stent. The the holes in the mesh are so small it won't allow micro catheter. So a micro guide wire. So once the stent's deployed, you can't go and put more coils in the aneurysms. What's your follow-up protocol for these types of cases? In, do you, are you doing uh, CTA follow-up, diagnostic angio follow-up? It's DSA. So you know, and there, there's different. There's certainly different recipes around the world, and a lot of it has to do with uh, geographic, I guess, um, factors. To, to I guess to, to say one thing, but more or less everybody will do a first a first follow-up DSA study, usually at about six months, sometimes three months, depending on how concerned you are. In our practice, we repeat a full four-vessel angio at 18 months, and then we'll move on to MRA. So whenever you use coils, uh, you get a lot of beam hardening artifacts and streak artifacts, you can't see the aneurysm neck. Whereas new MR techniques, especially the contrast enhanced time resolve techniques, when you look at the the, um, the source data from the different the different phases, you can actually get really good evaluation of the instant flow and the aneurysm itself. So we've we've transitioned more to the more complex kind of uh, technique MR follow up for delayed patients. So you see so now, now is there some stasis in the aneurysm sac? That's great. From the flow diversion. And that's it. Aneurysm treated. We'll do a final head run to make sure there's no distal emboli or any issues, and then pull out and put on a TR band.